Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to seventh week here at the Oxford Union. I'm delighted to introduce the CEO of UK Music, Jamie and Joku Goodwin. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. And uh, you've, you're going to give us a little talk about um, how you've got to where you are. As I say, you are the, the CEO, at only 30, of UK Music. And before that, were a special advisor to the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, during a fairly quiet period in politics. Um, would you like to give us a little talk about, uh, I think you've got some prepared remarks of how you got here. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, look, as you say, I'm here with two hats on uh, as a former special advisor in government. So working in government, particularly during the pandemic but also as the chief executive of UK Music, which is the body that represents the British music industry. Now, normally those two wouldn't be linked at all. And I got here by a slightly circuitous route. Uh, I think it all starts about oh, kind of, what, 13 years ago now, when as a 17 year old, a brilliant charity called the Capitalina Music Trust, which is dedicated to try and get people from disadvantaged backgrounds into classical music basically, gave me a ticket to a string quartet uh, not much interest in classical music. I went along, it completely blew my mind and decided I wanted to go and, wanted to go and study music at university. Uh, so I found myself studying music, I was at Nottingham University, doing that for three years, uh, graduating, and somehow finding myself interning, well, volunteering uh, in uh, MP's office. Uh, I worked way up through there, found myself working at Conservative Party HQ during the 2015 general election in the press office. Uh, and then for Linton Crosby, who's an uh, election strategist uh, and working for Linton for a couple of years. And then back in 2018, uh, when Matt Hancock became culture secretary, he was looking for a special advisor. Now, I wasn't quite sure what a special advisor was. Uh, it's sort of it's described as various different things. Is it someone who carries someone's bags? Is it someone who speaks to journalists on behalf of a minister? Is it someone who advises him on policy? In reality, it's basically a a combination of all those things. Uh, but I got this job with Matt as culture secretary, worked at DCMS for four months uh, as his special advisor there, and then was moved to the health department, where we did a year of uh, planning for Brexit, um, straight to the NHS, and focusing quite deep on health policy. Now, you get to 2019, after a couple of years of uh, all sorts of Brexit wars in Parliament, uh, madness happening, referendums, elections. Uh, the 2019 election happened. Uh, there was a majority of the government. And there's this moment where I think lots of people were thinking, right, the last few years have been quite mad. The last few years have been completely crazy, but now there's going to be some normality. Now there's going to be a bit more, uh, a bit more sense and order in place. And then a month later, bam, pandemic hits. And uh, <laughs> what we've had for the last year becomes my my daily life, and I suppose we, we, can, we can go over in a bit more detail in terms of just what it's like being a special advisor in normal times, but especially during the pandemic. Um, but uh, I essentially found myself at the heart of a lot of what's happened in the past year in government until October just gone, when I was offered a job as the chief executive of UK Music, so the, the, the trade body that represents the music industry as a whole. So I started UK Music a couple of months ago, and it does mean that I found myself having both these two hats on of someone who is involved very much in decision making, advising government and operating the heart of government, and then also someone who's representing an industry who has been affected by those decisions on a daily basis. Uh, this pandemic has really seen the intersection between government and business that can cross between public policy and the private sector becoming so much more acute than ever, I think. So decision making in government it affects people's lives all the time, but now more than ever, and now much more immediately than ever, I think, so it used to be that if you wanted to have a small legislative change, you'd need months worth of consultation. Um, there'd be all sorts of public debate about it, all sorts of media debate about it, all sorts of parliamentary debate about it. The nature of this pandemic now essentially means that you'll have a meeting, you'll see data, and six hours later, you could find a whole swathe of the country being locked down or a whole number of restrictions being introduced. Now there's there's arguments in favor of that. There's things, there's people who might be quite uncomfortable about that. But it does mean that the nature of decision making has changed radically in the last year and the way government operates these days actually looks very different to what it does previously but it does mean also that i've seen things from the government side but then also now living through things from the industry side uh representing an industry that has been absolutely devastated by this pandemic uh which is battling to survive through it but which is also asking itself very searching questions about not just how you emerge from the pandemic but what is things going to look like for our industry in the years to come
Um, what's going to be happening in the music industry in five years' time? What's going to be happening in 10 years' time? And is the music industry that we're going to be seeing post-pandemic? Will it represent, will it look like the music industry that it would look like as we went into the pandemic? Um, there'll be some things that will be very different. Some things might be the same. Some things we won't really do before as we did at all. So there's a lot of fascinating questions that have been um, that have been thrown up by a lot of that. And um, and yes, yeah, it, it, look forward to discussing them with you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, mate. Um, it's wonderful in a way that your you, this story kind of goes full circle with music at its heart. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, pre-COVID government, post-COVID government, and then move on to that music thing. But I'm going to do the lazy readout of a of a of an, an interviewer straight away, um, and ask you a little bit about your favourite music, your favourite song. I think you once told me that it was Shostakovich that really got you almost physically excited. But go on, give us from any maybe the people behind you or something else your favourite kind of music so people get a flavour. <laughs> Oh, well, Tris, at the moment, one of the things that I've missed, and this is bringing us back to the present now, one of the things I've missed, well, if you asked me that question a year and a half ago, I'd have ruled off absolutely anything. I'd have talked about Dire Straits, I'd have talked about John Lennon, I'd have talked about Beethoven, Shostakovich and Purcell. Actually, I think one of the things that people have really missed in the past year has been that sensation of live music and enjoying music with other people. So actually, there's all sorts of things I'd, I will... Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Brahms obsessive and I talk about Brahms until the cows come home but actually give me anything in a small basement bar with live music uh, side by shoulder by shoulder jowl by jowl with people um, and I'd be very happy but it's fascinating it's one of those I do often find those questions about what music you enjoy what music you like to be a really really fascinating thing because you can never predict it and it's always totally subjective so if you put a thousand people in a concert hall or in a or in a kind of venue or a large a large gig, every single one of those people will have a different emotional reaction to what they're listening to. Um, you can't predict it. I've been into concerts before where I've heard one of the best orchestras in the world play a uh, play a Brahms symphony and been completely bored and unmoved by it, and then three weeks later heard a really bad amateur orchestra play exactly the same piece and it's completely changed my life. And it's one of those things you can't predict it. You can't ever actually really tell why sometimes. It has a completely different emotion of action for people. I'm sure me and you would, if we, we would, uh, if we both went to the same, the same, um, the same gig or the same concert, we'd have very different responses to it. And it is one of those things I think that fascinates people about music and about arts and culture more broadly because there is, I don't believe in objective, <laughs> objective reality, but one of the beauties of music in particular is it is fundamentally subjective to so many different people. Brilliant. And, and so you talk about arts and culture more broadly. That's what got you into government in the, the first place. So you were brought into the what was then the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. And I think it's now had the word digital sort of shoehorned in there as well. So tell us a little bit about what government's like on the inside, day to day, nitty gritty before this COVID nonsense hit us. It is. So government is fundamentally uh the idea of government i think people on the outside of government they often think it's very well ordered it's very clear actually within government you've got so many different things happening you've got so many different teams different bodies different organizations but the role of departments particularly like dcms it's not a big spending department it's not a big operational department uh, departments like dcms are focused on actually steering the system actually kind of setting up that sort of system leadership actually trying to sometimes just champion sectors uh promote sectors and make sure that these sectors that actually are fundamentally important uh, have the sort of place and priority and weight in government uh, that they really should do. So one of the things we were trying to do in DCMS when we first started was almost get the sense of DCMS away from being the Department of Fun. So you may have, I think you may have heard this, a lot of people may have heard this. DCMS, Department for Culture, was always described sometimes a little bit unfairly. Well, actually, sometimes very fairly, but sometimes a little bit dismissively as the Department for Fun. It was the part where people went to for all the fun things, all the concerts, all the gigs, all the fun tech stuff. Actually, we all saw it as a department of the future. Um, and we always, we always always try to talk about it as such. Because when you look at the creative industries, the creative industries are worth £111 billion pounds a year to the UK economy. They are one of the largest sectors in the UK economy. And it's one of the places where, as a country, we succeed internationally above almost anywhere else. So if you look at music, the UK is the second largest exporter of music in the world. We are literally a world leader. I know the, the world, the word world beat, the, the phrase world beating gets used quite a lot these days and often by me. But when it comes to the music industry and our wider creative sectors, uh, world beating is not an understatement. Um, and so making sure that those sectors have got the support they need 
and you're engaging with the people who are running those sectors who are being impacted by those sectors and you're making sure that within government you can be uh, supporting those sectors and making sure that they're being just as successful not just now but into the future is one of the real priorities of, of, um, of government and one of the things we really focus on when we were at ECMS. And I suppose there's the the, the B word that um, you spent some of your career trying to avoid that I spent a lot of my career even now trying to avoid, but that Brexit comes along and you now, I suppose, have to find yourself dealing with a bit of that. But being in the middle of all of the, the Brexit shenanigans at the time, was that a just, I presume, a massive distraction? Or what was it like being involved in some of that work day to day of Brexit going on all around you? It was a tough one, really, because I think sometimes it could feel like a distraction, but... I wouldn't just dismiss it as a distraction because it's obviously hugely, hugely important and we're still dealing with some of the impacts right now. But when you're in government, what you want to be doing is, it's all about prior, it's all about prioritising things, but it's also about what you're adding value on and what you're delivering. Now, often when it came to Brexit, it would be very much caught up in debates about things and often quite ideologically charged debates. But often when you're working in government and the whole debate around Brexit is, do you have a second referendum or do you leave with no deal? Sometimes using political capital to get involved in those sorts of debates actually isn't really particularly helpful. There's all sorts of things you want to be delivering in government. Uh, in the Department for Digital Culture and Sport, we're looking at what we can be doing to roll out broadband across the country. We're looking at how we can be making sure that uh, the wider cultural and creative sector has got the funding it needs. Um, you're looking at what you need to be doing in terms of making sure that um, tech platforms are behaving responsibly. And all those sorts of issues that you really want to be focusing on, sometimes they feel like they're being distracted on by sort of a, an internal debate sometimes in Brexit, and not just internal debate within government, but uh, a debate within Whitehall and within Westminster. And so often I would, I, I didn't end up having too much to do with it myself when I was at BCNS. In the part of the health, when I moved there a couple of months later, one of the big issues we had was preparing for no-deal Brexit, which was fundamentally important because when you're help and run the health service, um, making sure that health service is always going to be there to deliver to people whatever the circumstances is mission critical. So while you had this on-running debate about how we're going to leave the EU, was it going to be with a deal, was it going to be without a deal, I think the mission for lots of us was to make sure that all bases were covered. Um, and it actually came in quite potentially useful actually for the next year when we were doing the pandemic, because one of the things you found yourself doing during that Brexit phase in the Department for Health was looking in total detail at supply chains, working out exactly how every single medicine you need to get into the country comes through. And you learn some fascinating things. I think lots of people will think, oh, if you're buying penicillin or if you're buying a, uh, an antibiotic here, you get it from your pharmacy. You don't realise how many countries it goes through. It needs to be, one bit is manufactured in Swansea, it's then flown to Belgium where it's added to that compound. And there's a compound in China that gets added to that. And you realise just how complex some of these supply chains are. And because we weren't really sure what was going to be happening with, uh, with Brexit, making sure that we had a really clear understanding of where those supply chains were and were, what sort of uh, processes things were going through actually meant that when the pandemic hit, when international travel completely stopped and you were having to, come, having to become a lot more self-reliant on things like medicines, having that understanding of how those supply chains were working actually came in, um, came in quite useful. So um, I know there were sort of, when it came to Brexit, I always, I always felt there were, there were risks and there were opportunities and our job as a government was to do everything we could to mitigate those risks. Um, but then when there were, were opportunities, take advantage of those opportunities. Um, but I think one of the things we definitely learned from, uh, from preparing for it in the Department of Health was, uh, was quite applicable to the pandemic the next year. That's a, a very smooth response to Brexit in short there. Opportunities and threats, very good. Um, but so you see, you did such a good job for your for your boss, Matt Hancock, in the Department for Fun, uh, Department for the Future, that you get moved from that department into the health department. And a couple of weeks ago at the Oxford Union, we had a debate that this house believes the NHS is the envy of the world. And speaking in favour of that was Matt's predecessor, Jeremy Hunt. Um, and against it was a bunch of uh, people who said that it's actually a fairly crummy health service, um, uh, some people that you might know, people like Kate Andrews and Christian Nemitz, who are saying, actually, if you look around the world, there are much better systems. And I, I doubt I'm going to get you to agree with them. But coming into that role from such a different department, what was your first impression on the state of the healthcare service in the UK before any of the pandemic hit? So I love the way people talk about the health and the NHS as if it is a single entity. I think the big thing I learned when I came in was 
it's not a single entity. We may talk about it as the, the DNHS, as though it's a big, it's a big single thing that moves in the same direction. I think someone once described it as, as like trying to be. I think maybe actually <laughs> was it Jeremy Hunt? It was it was a previous health doctor who described trying to sh shift health policy is like trying to marshal one big oil tanker. Actually, I always felt like it was like trying to marshal a whole flotilla of little ships and little boats. Because actually, fundamentally, the health service, it isn't just you say one thing and the whole thing operates accordingly. Um, it is thousands of primary care organisations, hospital trusts, individual, individual private providers or GPs, as we know them more formally, um, and trying to make sure they're all going in the same way, are all doing exactly the same thing. It would be hugely, hugely difficult. But I think the thing that really strikes you is the passion, the commitment, um, the real professionalism from people working in the health system, um, but also that there are things you could be in, there are things you should be improving and should always be improving. I don't think it's necessarily a zero sum game between is it the envy of the world or are there things you could be doing to improve it? Um, I think Jeremy Hunt's completely right that people across the world will look at a publicly funded healthcare system, um, one of the most efficient healthcare systems you've got around. Um, and a system whereby it can guarantee people medical care free at the point of use, that is something that people would envy. But there'll also be things like the NHS that we can look at in terms of other countries where we can definitely make improvements. I think one of the big ones we had was tech. So uh, coming into the NHS where it was impossible for have, have things like interoperability, um, systems that wouldn't talk to each other, someone would have a stroke and be treated at one hospital, and then they go to their GP the next day and their GP would have absolutely no idea that they'd just be in hospital being treated for X, Y, Z because their computer systems wouldn't talk to each other. So I think the the idea, sometimes in political debate, there seems to be this sense that you can either love the NHS and say it's completely flawless or you can't be at all positive about it. Actually, we should be positive about our NHS. We should also be quite frank and honest about the problems it has and where we could be seeking to to improve it. So yeah, I mean, in a classic political sort of way, I'll split the difference between your two, <laughs> between your two uh, your two points of view. You you, uh, you pointed out earlier. <laughs> so the, the but this system that you say could, could be improved and everything. It had the ultimate stress test recently. So there's no, obviously nobody watching, nobody in the world who doesn't know the, the events we've been through in the last year. I think I remember you and I when we were in government sitting uh, together when the first maybe the first death was announced or certainly something like that. And so you were right with your nose up against all of this right from the very beginning. So what was the first inkling you heard about coronavirus? Give us the story. So I suppose the first time I heard of it, it would have been very early January where we were having meetings in the department and within government around January, it's always a really tough year for the NHS because you have winter pressure, you have capacity being incredibly stretched, um, and you often have a, like a very sadly large number of deaths from flu. Um, so you often have numerous meetings within, within the department looking at what we could be doing, what more we should be doing, where we should be focusing resources, where are areas were hotspots, and what we could be doing to help, uh, to help system resilience. And actually, in that January meeting, uh, now, flu season of twenty of Christmas 2019, early 2020, had been quite mild. And one of the takeaways from the meeting was the flu season wasn't nearly as bad as people feared it might be. Um, and I think I do remember someone saying, it looks like this is going to be, this is, <laughs> this is going to be a much better year than we probably thought we, we, we may have been. And then in that meeting, someone said, obviously, we need to keep an eye on this, um, on this flu, from, on this flu, or this um, potential uh, pneumonia, or this little, this virus that's happening. There have been some reports from China. Um, people are asking, okay, what, what's, what, what's this? Um, not clear at the moment, not much information coming out of it, but we're going to keep, a, we're going to keep an eye on it. Um, I think one of the challenges we, we did have in this pandemic was it didn't start from a country where we had lots of intelligence on, lots of data on, lots of LinkedIn on. It started quite, almost like quite opaquely. We weren't quite sure exactly what was happening. It was quite hard to get data um, on where actually the, the thing was. Um, and it wasn't until a lot later that you actually realised the extent of it. Um, so I think that 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 first meeting in early early January where it was first referenced, and then I think as, as days went on, uh, it became it went from being a thing in a small province of China um, to um, to a pandemic and epidemic that was impacting all our lives within the space of, of a month. 
so so what 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 happens there? Give give people watching a kind of uh, flavor of this. So you, to be clear, we're, we're very close to to Matt Hancock all the way through all these things. You've got at least I think in government a good couple of phones that are sort of going off all the time, dealing with press um, requests and interest as well as departmental stuff. How does how does a story on this scale kind of blow up and your reaction to it as a and, and government's reaction to it? Yeah, so I suppose well, the normal day of a special advisor. Well, I'll kind of work through it. It normally starts about 5.30 a.m. where your alarm goes off and you're kind of like catching up on what all the main stories are for about 20 minutes. You then got the big milestone, which is the six o'clock bulletin. So you turn on the Today programme and you hear what's leaving the uh, the 6 a.m. the 6 a.m. news. Uh, after that, about kind of like quarter past six, you're then having to potentially respond to things that may have dropped overnight. Uh, potentially you're kind of calling up broadcast journalists who've just been reporting on the 6 a.m. bulletin making sure that uh, kind of make sure that stories are in the right place. You then have a uh, playbook, which many of you might know, uh, which is the, it, the Westminster briefing email that everyone reads in Westminster, which lands at seven o'clock. Uh, you're often talking to playbook just right up until they send that out. Playbook book drops at seven o'clock. You're taking a load of things from that. You're kind of making calls. You're trying to damp down stories. Uh, you get to about 8.30, then you're kind of getting into the office. You're having a meeting with your Secretary of State. You're working out how the day is looking. You're then going through the next couple of hours. You've got meetings all the time. You're jumping in and out of. You're getting towards the lunchtime news bulletin. So the 1 p.m. news bulletins are the big, uh, are the main ones at lunchtime. You're trying to shape those stories. You're speaking to the journalists. You're speaking to number 10 and trying to make sure that everything's in the same place. As you go through the day, you've got a load of calls from print journalists who are starting to write and file their stories. That gets through you through to about 3, 4, 5 p.m. Then the 6 p.m., the 6 p.m. Uh, broadcast news bulletins, which are the ones that are particularly important because the key broadcast bulletins you want to be shaping are the 10 p.m. That's when everyone gets home. Well, this is in the day when people used to actually uh, be out of their homes for most of the day. But normally the 10 p.m. bulletins are the ones you're worried about because that's when people get home. That's when they get most of their viewers. And the BBC and the ITV 10 p.m. bulletins are the ones you want your stories to be on. You want the, the shaping and the, and the framing to be favourable to you and your team and your government. And 6 p.m. bulletins are sometimes a bit of a warm-up for that. So they'll use very much many of the same stories. Uh, they'll often kind of take packages from that bulletin and put them into the 10 p.m. But if there's issues with things they're reporting, if there are things that are not quite right, you've got a couple of hours to then shape that, get on the phone to the journalists, sort things at a policy level within the department and make sure that the 10 p.m. news bulletins are kind of completely on point. You get to 10 p.m., you've normally got to speak to Newsnight, who then who are kind of going at about quarter to 11. You get to about half past 11 and then you start speaking to Playbook again uh, in time for the next morning's newsletter. And you normally get to bed at about 1.30, 2 o'clock. Um, and that's when you're not in a pandemic. Um, as soon as the pandemic comes up, uh, <laughs> it goes 10 times that. So normally when you're in a department, you will have sort of quite some medium moments and some very, 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 very busy moments. So if you're in the education department around A-levels or uh, exam results days, you have a real frenetic kind of few days of activity. And it might be five or six days of madness, but then you can sort of go back to things being medium, you can uh, rest and uh, kind of get back into things. In a pandemic, particularly when you're in the health department, every day, the top story is your department. Um, every day, everything that's happening is about your department. And every day, everything that's impacting other departments is coming from your department. So you're finding yourself not just having to handle the media agenda that is obsessed with coronavirus and COVID-19 and what the government's doing. You've also got every other government department onto you about things because you're at the sharp end of it. I mean, to the extent that uh, very well, he's still a very good friend of mine, but um, a special advisor in, in, the, in the business part, actually, he always said to me that he his heart was sunk when he saw my, my, my number come up on his phone because he knew it meant that another set so the economy was about to be um, was about to be shut down or locked down. So instead, it, it actually triggered him whenever he whenever he saw my <laughs> name coming up on his phone. Um, but it would mean it was completely intense. Um, it was very much twenty four seven. But there was also the need to when you're fighting those sort of day to day battles and trying to get through things as best you can, trying to maintain that sort of strategic long term focus as well, because it can be so easy in government to get bogged down on the hour by hour and day by day. One of the things you need to be doing in government and is so important to do in government is to be able to take a step back and say, okay, where are we going to be in two weeks' time? Where are we going to be in six months' time? Where are we going to be in a year? What do we need to be doing now? 
to make sure that the conditions are in the right place for that. Because if you're not careful, you can find yourself fighting day by day, not really having any sense of strategic focus or long-term vision. And that tends to be when governments find themselves getting in, um, getting in the most trouble. Doesn't sound like a terribly envious day starting at half past five and ending at two if you're lucky. But that, just quickly before we move on to, to some other things about the virus and then on to your, your, your second life now, it just other than playbook there, that doesn't sound like a terribly different cycle of a day to what was maybe happening 10 years ago, even 15, maybe 20 years ago. So the, the government is still so entrenched to the six and the 10 or the six o'clock news and the 10 o'clock news and the Today programme. You didn't manage to mention the, the bane of most people's lives, Twitter or anything like that. Is that. Does it just not factor in as much as it as people maybe assume it does? Maybe the people on Twitter assume that it does? So Twitter is really, really important for the right audience. So Twitter is fundamental when it comes to talking to Westminster. It's irrelevant when it's come to talking to the public. Now, if you want to be talking to the public, there's a certain set of kind of places you can really be, um, you, you're targeting, and that is your broadcast media, um, and it's the front pages of your papers. Uh, I remember used to, to one of my, well, I think, uh, I think it was Linton, but one of my old, one of my old bosses always used to say that if you want to really get cut through, um, front page of the Metro and on the bulletin of Smooth FM is where you really want to be. Now, most people in Westminster will obsess about Twitter. If someone tweets something, they're kind of like, oh, this person tweeted that, that person tweeted that. It was actually, and it comes back to the point I was made about st stepping back from the day to day and trying to work out what's actually really important. Um, there's a whole load of media that, while they can be important in shaping things, again, if you get something going on Twitter, you might find it getting onto the front page of the Metro, you might find it getting onto the front page of the Guardian. But actually, just that in itself, doesn't actually really necessarily mean that you're getting your message out, you're getting your message out across the right people. Because when you look at Twitter and social media, the sorts of people that will take their news from, from, well, take their news from, from Twitter and social media, um, it can be a lot of people, but it can normally be a, a certain set of people in the very kind of like same demographic of things. And I know there was that phrase where, was it, I think it was Cameron about five years ago, that line where Britain is not Twitter, which it wasn't, it was, uh, not the most soaring rhetoric, but actually completely, com completely, uh, completely true. And one of the problems you can get in government is people will often confuse where the public actually is with where Twitter is. And so it's often quite important to make sure we're not being too skewed by where um, by where social media is. Open. Absolutely. And members can can finish the rest of the sentence by Googling it of what he said, too many tweets made. Um, they can Google that without us having to talk about it. A couple, just one or two last questions on the on the pandemic, because I know we want to get on to talking about um, uh, uh, sort of the benefits of UK music and for all the sort of music students who are members of the union and, and kind of careers and things like that. But just looking back, as exactly as you said there, taking a step back on some of these sorts of things with a bit more um, space lockdowns and the vaccine these are humongous topics and the kind of freedom that we've now uh are hopefully going to be afforded and that we've lost um do you think that the world is going to be or britain is going to be particularly changed forever coming out of all of this are people going to want to be a lot freer i mean i suppose live music can get on to you hope people will want to go out and do more or have we permanently sort of maybe changed the national psyche of people being forever more nervous because of some of the decisions that you were involved in taking so it's a fascinating question. I think the reality is we're not going to know for sure um, until we get there. I have I have friends, I know people who are absolutely desperate to get back to a big 100,000 festival where they can just kind of like mix with strangers. And I still know people who have it. And I know people who, who've got relatives who have had the vaccine, but still feel nervous going to the shops. Um, the reality of this is this has been a, it's been a pandemic whereby social contact has come with the implicit assumption that there's a risk attached to it. Um, the paradigm of the last year has been physical contact, social contact um, has an implicit risk. And that doesn't just disappear with a snap of the fingers overnight. It's why the vaccine rollout is so important. Um, and it's why the data from the vaccine is so encouraging. Many people worried that when we got the first vaccine to COVID, one, it would take many, many years, but two, um, it, might be, it might be effective, but nowhere near as effective as it actually has been. Um, and there's a huge credit to those who've been working on the vaccine um, and the scientific minds behind the vaccine, that we actually have within a year of this pandemic hitting us, a vaccine that is hugely effective, will drastically reduce your risk of uh, being hospitalised or dying from this virus, and will also greatly uh, reduce your risk of transmission. So there'll be some people that may be very nervous about things, there'll be some people that may uh, be looking to come back out, but I think very much we're not just going, whatever happens, we're not just going to go back to 
January 29, January 2020 at the end of this thing. Um, there have been all sorts of structural changes in the economy, but all sorts of changes behaviourally that I think we were probably going in that direction anyway. Uh, but this has just um, really sped up. So a lot of things about working from home, lots of people have realised how, well, lots of people have realised that it's quite nice to work from home. Lots of people have actually realised they don't really like working from home all the time. They like to have that sort of contact with their co-workers. They like to be able to still be speaking to colleagues. And you can actually be much more productive when you're working in the same room as people. Now, that doesn't mean that we're just going to say, right, everyone's going to keep working from home indefinitely. And it doesn't mean we're going to say, we're going to go back to where we were before things. I wouldn't be surprised if we find ourselves in more of a situation where you still have central offices or you still have working spaces, but it's just much more normalised for people to work two days a week from home and then come to the office every like three days. But it all depends. It will all be behavioural. And I think it's all yet to be seen because, uh, yeah, we, I think we're still waiting to, waiting to see what the real impact is going forward. The, the last question I normally uh, have been asking people all this term is what's the one thing we should be talking about or worried about but that we aren't? But as I think I know your, your answer to this is related to this sort of half, I'll ask you, you now. So what is the one thing in your opinion that we either as um, members of the Oxford Union, as the government, as Britain, what should we be talking about or worried about but that we aren't at the moment? So on this one, uh, the next pandemic. So that sounds really, really depressing. And <laughs> I, sound like, I sound like such a sort of killjoy to be, uh, we've, we've got a vaccine being rolled out, we've got a roadmap when we're coming out of restrictions. I know I should be worrying about getting my hair cut, which I desperately need, and working out which live music event I'm going to first. But actually, I do think one of the things we really should be thinking about is the next pandemic. Um, and actually working out how we should live through that, how, how we can operate through that. Mm. So the reality is being that in the past year, we have actually been exceptionally lucky. When I say lucky, this has been an awful year. Um, it's claimed hundreds of thousands of lives here in the UK and millions globally. Um, so you'd never say that's lucky. But the reality is that this pandemic could have been so much worse. Um, and the way it's transpired, to have a vaccine within a year has been extraordinary. But over the past year, the vaccine has basically meant that we are able to come out of this, hopefully within 18 months of it hitting. That's not the norm for most pan for many pandemics. Um, and the question for us should be, well, the premise for us shouldn't be, right, we have a pandemic every 100 years. The last big one was the Spanish flu in 1918. We had this one at the end of 2019. I guess we can put our feet up and think this isn't going to happen again until 20, uh, 2020, uh, 21, 21. Um, actually, that's a nonsense. Um, if you look at the tough drivers and the factors that influence the likelihood of pandemics, it's things like climate change, it's things like increased um, increased international travel, it's mixing societies. Um, there's a whole number of reasons why we should should think that we could be finding another one of these things hitting us in like well, in 15 years time, in 10 years time. I don't know. I hope I hope we don't get hit by another one of these for another century. But I wouldn't want to be betting on it. I think the policy question we're going to need to be asking ourselves right now is we've just lived through a pandemic what sort of things can we be doing what sort of things should we be doing to make sure that when the next one hits we can be operating as viably as possible the experience we had was at the start of this pandemic was not having the capacity to be doing mass testing and testing hundreds of thousands of people a day we ended up building that up in six weeks time which was incredible but what we want to be doing is making sure that if another one of these things hits we've got the blueprint for a testing system you can stand up, some sort of ways of being able to do social contact uh, safely. One of the things I've been working lots on within the music industry um, with the Music Venue Trust has been, are there ways you can make spaces safe for social contact in the context of a pandemic? So there's all sorts of machinery, all sorts of things like ventilation systems, air purification systems, particularly ones that are used in Asia. Um, things, looking at things like, in, I mean, I have some scientists, well, I have some, Companies come into me with uh, an innovation around UV light that blends UV light with air purification systems that reduces the risk of any sort of COVID transmission. And they say could completely take COVID particles basically out of the air in spaces. Now, this may be complete nonsense. It may be revolutionary, um, but I don't really know. If you look at um, uh, if you look at uh, things like water draining sy systems, um, historically um, they started to be done, uh, used with sand after the cholera pandemic in Germany in the 1800s basically because they had a cholera pandemic that was spread by uh, water kind of water dispensation systems that weren't filtered, and that was spreading quickly. Immediately after that, a whole load of European countries 
started um, started looking at new ways they could be doing water filtration um, and water dispensation. We always need to be having that conversation now, right now, um, because we've just lived through the last 12 months, it's fresh in our mind, but we've also seen what works, what doesn't work. And we want to be finding a way, we should be finding a way and should be having this conversation now, not just about the social recovery and the economic recovery, but about pandemic resilience and working out if another one of these hits in 10 years time, what can the UK be doing to make sure we can operate viably through that entire pandemic rather than having a strategy that's just trying to reduce cases as much as possible through knocking down the country and then waiting for a vaccine? Because, I mean, we've been incredibly fortunate that a vaccine come through this uh, this quickly this time and we can't really bank on the next time being, being, being just fortunate really. I mean, I think it's it's such a fascinating idea that you should probably consider another career, maybe in advising governments on things, perhaps. Um, <laughs> we're going to move now to the, 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 I suppose, the reason you're allowed to uh, to come and talk to us and not just be working saving the UK music industry right now. Um, it, it may not be, as you said at the start, as much of a, of a jump between the two things. I, I'm sure that you hoped that your whole job would be going to live music venues and giving me that record contract that you promised me. Um, but what is the current state of the, of the UK music industry, given the almost total shutdown of hospitality and large events and everything. What's the lay of the land now? So I think the really important thing to do when talking about where the industry is now, just to set out how devastating COVID has been for the industry, is to talk about the, the trajectory we were on pre-pandemic. So in twenty in twenty nineteen, the music industry was a five point eight billion pound industry. We contributed five point eight billion pounds to the economy. We supported two hundred thousand jobs and generated two point nine billion pounds of exports. Um, now, just to put that in context, um, and I always make this comparison, and I mean, no offence to any of my friends or anyone on this um, uh, on, the, on this talk who has interest in fishing. I think the fishing industry is a very important national industry, but the UK fishing industry contributed £446 million to the economy in 2019 and supported 12,000 jobs. The music industry was £5.8 billion and 200,000 jobs. Um, that's just to put that in context. Lots of people recognise how important fishing is to the, to the UK, the important historical, economic and emotional attachment lots of people have in the UK to the fishing industry. Um, the music industry is, is more than 10 times larger and it supports 15 times more jobs. And that was going in a very positive direction. We were seeing double digit growth, jobs were increasing, economic value was increasing. And as we were going into the 2020s, as we were going into this new decade, actually, if you were to pick sectors where you thought the UK was going to be leading the world, sectors that you thought were going to be British success stories in this decade, the music industry should have been one of them. Now, COVID hit. There are many sectors that have been able to operate viably through COVID. You can do things like working from home. You can do things like getting, you don't operate in exactly the same way, but the fundamental business model doesn't get disrupted as much as the music industry. The music industry, in particular live music, which is a vital part of the ecosystem, live music thrives on social contact just like COVID. So as soon as you have a pandemic where social contact is seen as how this thing is spread and the logical policy um, result of that is to limit social contact, the music industry was essentially shut down early night. Um, you can't be having live events. Um, there were, so you what, if you go through it, it's like bans on mass events, things like curfew 10 p.m., bans on uh, more than 50 people meeting, more than 30 people meeting up, um, bans on uh, the bans on alcohol sales and um, all through this pandemic a lot of the things that have been done completely understandably from a public health point of view have had a devastating impact on the music industry um, there are 200,000 people working in the industry three quarters of those are self-employed and many of them haven't really had been had access to a lot of the support schemes um, that government has done um, because if you're a musician if you're working in the music industry you have a very unique set of circumstances um, it's not just a standard sole trader where you can say, these are my profits last year, therefore I can get this one. Um, you're often doing a job with that person, a job with that organisation, jumping onto that organisation. And it's meant it's been very difficult for people in the industry to get access to the economic support. So we've gone in the space of a few months from being an industry that should have been, again, I, I, I think of the music industry as a key national asset. I describe it as such. because I think it is one of the things that makes the UK great. Um, it benefits our soft power. It has huge economic benefits. Um, the benefits can be seen economically at a regional level, and everyone knows their local music venue. It's a key part of your local communities. Um, this is one of those sectors that um, we should be incredibly proud of and should have been going in a positive direction, but COVID has completely devastated it and knocked it down. 
And it just makes it even more, I think, even more tragic what's happened to us as an industry because we were on that positive trajectory as we came into COVID. So we get to the end of the government's roadmap or at the end of June and everything's open back up again. Everything's great. Everything's fine. The music industry gets started turning back on again. People watching this, students, musicians, prospective people, what does their, what does a career look like for them? Is there, you know, it, how easy is it going to be to get back into these things? I know you said you studied music and you're annoyingly good at playing the piano, but are, are there, what, what routes in to the, to the industry are there, either for musicians or for technicians and this whole other thing? And, and how is that going to be affected by what's happened? Yeah. So I think there's, there's two parts to it. There's one, the encouraging side of things, I think, would be that people have, well, people have missed music and missed live music in a way that I think people only realise how important it is to them. So you, they, people will say that uh, you don't truly appreciate something until it's gone. You don't realise how much you miss something until you can't have it. And I think across the country, People have missed live music. They've understood just how important it is to, to their lives. Um, and I think it will be, it should post-pandemic have a lot more value, social value placed in it um, than it did pre-pandemic. And that's not just the act of going to a gig. Um, it's the mental health benefits of it. Again, I when I was um, when I was working in government, when I'd have a particularly bad long day and I was still in the office at 10.30, I'd go down to the canteen and, sit and play the piano, and there'd be a there'd be a, a cleaning. Someone's coming to sing Lay Miz with me. It was lovely, um, but like sometimes that was generally. And it's, it can sound silly to people sometimes, but like for my own kind of mental health and well-being, sitting and playing the piano for, for like for forty-five minutes at the end of the day was so important to me. Going and singing in a choir with friends, um, kind of going to gigs with people, it made such a difference to your mental health. And people really missed that in the past year. They really appreciated that role that it plays. And so post-pandemic, there should be. There can be some optimism in terms of the way that music is perceived across society because I think it should be a real moment for us to say this is our social value, this is why people should care about our industry. But before that, there are a number of challenges because, as a sector, the policy questions of the sector have been twofold. It's been one: how do we support people through the sector through the pandemic and try and make sure that we can get as many people to the other side as possible? But then the longer term question is how can we get our sector operating again, back up and running. So a big issue we've got at the moment is this issue of insurance, whereby we have a date whereby uh, events can start again from June the 21st without safety distancing. Great, that's wonderful. Big problem, we can't get cancellation insurance for events. Uh, the private market won't, uh, won't insure events. I mean, to an extent, understandably, because there's been a pandemic on and if you insurer, it there's going to be a great deal of risk in insuring events. But it means that if you're planning a large event, and I hear this lots from festivals and large events, particularly in the last couple of days, because they don't know for sure that that June 21st date is going to go ahead and it won't be confirmed until the week before June 21st, they're essentially having to organise big events, festivals, gigs, concerts at their own financial risk, knowing that if that date is pushed a few weeks, they could be completely out of pocket. So there's issues like insurance that we've been doing a lot of work fresh from government on asking government to introduce a scheme along the same lines as the film and TV insurance restart scheme they've done, which has been amazingly, amazingly effective. Um, films and TV productions had exactly the same issue as us. So last summer, they didn't want to start filming or start shooting big productions because if there was another lockdown and they were cancelled, if they can't get insurance, they lose money. Um, that scheme by government has been amazingly effective. It's protected 14,000 jobs and enabled hundreds of productions to go ahead there's lots of things that probably lots of us will be watching on Netflix and iPlayer right now that have only been able to go ahead because there was a government insurance scheme. We want the same sort of thing uh, for the music industry to make sure that events can, can get up and running as soon as possible. But the other thing that's uh, hanging like a cloud over this, and I know we, we started talking about Brexit earlier with my Department for Health, with my ex-Department for Health hat on, um, but the challenges around Brexit have been huge for the music industry. Um, uh, in terms of what it's going to mean for us when we are uh, wanting to go work in Europe, tour in Europe, um, because as a sector, the music industry has always been very global. It's always been very Europe focused. So to give you an example, a case study, uh, uh, an opera singer I was speaking to just a few days ago, he had a portfolio career where much of what he did was based on, on a Tuesday, getting a call from Hamburg to say they need to step into this uh, to do a performance on a Wednesday. He previously jumped on the plane go to Hamburg, perform, come back to the UK a few days later, and that was just the way it was all done. A lot of the challenges we're finding now in terms of the potential for uh, 
um, the need for work permits and visas, um, and in particular, cabotage rules, um, which I'd i had never heard of the word cabotage until um, until a few months ago. Cabotage are the rules that essentially dictate whether or not uh, non-EU trucks and, uh, are allowed to cross, how many times they can cross borders and how many loads of goods they can take across different countries. So cabotage basically means that if you're a lorry you, or a truck, you're allowed to take goods across borders. Um, uh, you can do two stops and then you have to return to, UK, uh, you have to, return to your, your home country. So at the moment, UK trucks now are allowed to drive to Europe. They can do two stops and then they can drive, they need to drive back to the UK. Now that is fine for 90% of couriers. If you're a touring musician, if you're going on a tour somewhere, if you're gigging and you need to be taking your crew and your kit with you, that makes it completely impossible. It means it's illegal for you to be more than three concerts. Um, and it's things like that that have been hugely impactful for musicians. Um, very, very, very difficult for those who make their living from working in Europe often doing quite quick stops off, doing a few days, sometimes even just a few hours of a tour in Spain, Madrid, um, Belgium, and that's going to be made much, much more difficult. So a lot of what we're doing at the moment is we're working with government um, and sort of pressuring government to come up with, with a resolution on this, because when it comes to this issue, the most depressing thing is that both sides don't really want it. They don't really want it to be happening like this. So. The UK's position is that it wanted to protect touring rights for musicians and it made a proposal to the EU, but the EU rejected it. The EU's position is it wanted to protect musicians' touring rights and it made a proposal to the UK, but the UK rejected it. So both sides are saying they want it sorted and we're doing everything we can to try and find some good resolution and make sure we're supporting people because actually post-Brexit and post-Covid, one of the things we should want to be wanting to be doing as much as possible as a country is sending musicians abroad, sending our artists, our creative, um, our creative talent abroad, not just for the cultural exchange benefits, not just for the economic benefits, but also for the soft power benefits. Um, the music industry has always been something that successfully tried to flag the British abroad. Um, we were a global exporter pre-Brexit, and it's I think it's vital for lots of us that we've been doing everything we can to make sure it can be just successful post-Brexit as well as pre. So you've, you've found yourself in government being able to almost successfully avoid dealing with the B word and now you find yourself right in the middle of it a bit of what cabotage arbitrage or something the, the, one of the questions here is what why why how did it end up that we get there and I, I don't normally quote Lenin but what is to be done about that yeah so one of the things I've actually tried to do I want we want we all want to know how we got there and and how we've actually found our way here then the reality is when negotiations happen you always have offers being rejected, then uh, finding out where your opponent's red lines are, um, then you stake out where your red lines are and finding something that works for everyone. Um, it's We want to try and find out what's happened. We're still trying to find out exactly what happened, but I actually don't want to dwell too much on what happened because what we don't want is for this just to become a political like bashing around for people to say, oh, you should have done this or you should have done that. Um, and we don't want it to, to, to descend into recriminations. I think the EU and the UK are both saying they want to ensure uh, musicians can, can, can continue to tour. So rather than making it about the EU whacking the UK or the UK attacking the EU, and I should say, I, I mean, my, my, my Twitter has been interesting in the last couple of months on this because uh, half of the, whenever I can say this, what I'm about to say, I get half of people saying, no, this is wrong. You should be blaming the UK. This is all the UK government's fault. And the other half are saying, this is all the EU's fault. The EU's awful. Actually, I want to take a step back for this and say, look, both sides are saying they want to sort this. So the question shouldn't necessarily be on what happened six months ago, who screwed up, who dropped the ball. The question should be on, okay, like for the good of those people who work in the sector, for the good of people who are wanting to come into this sector and who are actually vitally important that we get some sort of resolution on this, what can we be doing now to resolve this? And make sure that um, and make sure we have a resolution on it. So that's sort of where we've got to. But um, but it's it, it's in, it's important to know why it happened. But we don't want that to be the focus. We prefer to be focused on solutions um, and solutions for this. Perfect. I mean, we're, we're running into our last kind of ten minutes, and as I think we have done before, and would like to do again, just talk to you for hours about all this kind of stuff. Um, I'm imagine I'm a, a music student undergrad who's a member of the Oxford Union, or, or on our on our YouTube channel later. Um, I'm a, a music, budding music student or musician, and I'm looking at this, as you say, this kind of once very, very growth sector, now completely, I mean, not even decimated, much more than that, uh, much more than 
what is what does my career look like what can what could you do to help short of just giving everyone watching a, a record deal because that's only going to me um you know what does what does the future look like for a buddy musician and what would your advice perhaps be so i think the future the reason there's caused optimism i think the way i often describe it is short-term pessimism long-term optimism so there are huge challenges over the next few months you know challenges that we're working night and day to try and resolve but in the longer term um, and even sort of in, in six months' time. Um, the Roaring Twenties back in 100 years ago were a result of not just the four years of war, but also the, well, it was a result of the world going through a four-year-long war the like of which they had never seen before, and then a two-year pandemic um, that took countless lives for millions of people. And the Twenties then became this huge celebration of, sort of excess and wildness um, but also kind of creative, um, uh, kind of creative inspiration, creative genius, where uh, where people came together, where people performed, people kind of thought of new ways of doing things, and it was a real celebration of the decade. And um, there's a real potential with having a similar stage of things um, again this decade, um, post pandemic, a real sort of national celebration, obviously in a, in a safe way. And I mean, celebration should be the right word because this pandemic has been absolutely awful. But a real national, a national coming together is probably better to, better to phrase it. Um, but also an opportunity to be doing the things that we haven't previously had the opportunity to do. So I think my, my advice to people would be, and this is my advice generally, um, have your default answer being yes to them. When opportunities come, take them. Um, if you don't have opportunities, make them. There's all sorts of fascinating things that are going on right now, whereby I think if you go back, if you go back 50 years ago, the way to get your record deal um, it was either being seen by the right person at the top of the pile and it becomes quite hard you almost have to hope that you'd be getting a gig at some venue somewhere and a big record executive would happen to be there and he'd see you that was sort of where it would, would suddenly be, be done now you've got all these sort of opportunities with live streaming um, the way people are using technology to, to find artists to get their music across to consume new content is fascinating and exciting and it's only going to explode from here on in so I think there's all sorts of, there should be all sorts of, or hopefully all sorts of opportunities post, post pandemic. Um, and I think people just need to, again, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, it's difficult. Uh, many of my friends uh, who I was at university with, who I'm still in now, um, are professional musicians. And people don't tend to be, a, well, you don't become a professional musician because it's a really easy, well-paid life. Um, it's something you do because you love it. Um, it's something you do, that it's, a, it's a livelihood, it's a way of life. Um, and it's something you do because you absolutely love it. Um, but there will be opportunities to place pandemic, I think we all hope. But, um, but I think uh, I think that it should hopefully be, uh, well, this should be temporary. Uh, what's happened in the past year, this hasn't been a dying sector. This hasn't been a sector that was going into this pandemic on the, on the decline. It was on the up. Um, there's a real body of work needed to get it back to where it was. But when it does get back to there, um, there should be some course of optimism for the future. This too shall pass, is a great saying. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to try and get some other other questions here. And some of them that I've been getting in, in the Q&A and people watching, please do still chuck some questions in there. And from, from other questions coming in from other sources is the, the kind of changing nature of the music industry. So we've got um, Jack McClure has asked, how is UK music representing artists vis-a-vis -vis the streaming giants? And other questions I've had coming in, you know, what does TikTok and the rise in sort of music-based social media mean? You know, we've gone from what? paying 79p for a song on iTunes now to what a tenner a month or something on Spotify and so live music aside what are you doing for artists and how does the the, the economics of the industry look yeah so it's a really fascinating question and I think lots of people in the industry are determined not to try and make some of the not to make some of the same mistakes that people often think we made kind of 20 years ago or so so I think the the thing people always point to is they they call it the naps the moment which was about 20 years ago, so things like Napster came along and there was a sort of choice people had to say, actually, this is the way, this is the way that, uh, this is the way that things are going, or they could say, no, this is just, this is just something we're just going to try and shut down. Um, and it was almost tried to push to one side. There were lots of, of legal, legal cases and things. I mean, rightly, because it was stealing people's copyright. It was stealing people's intellectual property. Um, it was a means for people taking content that people had created and making money off it, and money that wasn't going to the artists, money that wasn't going to the performers. But I think, in hindsight, lots of people now say the assumption that people would only ever want physical downloads. I mean, you'd have people saying, the phrase people always used to say 15, 15, well, 
15, 20 years ago, was people will always want a physical download. They'll always want to be able to like hold something like that. And they always want it. And you get the same thing with books now. People say, you always want to be holding the book. People always want to be holding the book. Um, and they ignore what's happening with ebooks, what's happening with audiobooks. Um, lots of people now think, and one of the things we're trying to make sure we're doing as an industry is we're looking forward 20 years. We're looking forward 10 years and 20 years and saying, actually, where are things going? And how can we be harnessing that to make sure that you are getting the very best for the whole industry? So you want to be in a situation where artists and musical creators are benefiting. You want to be in a situation where record labels are benefiting. You want to be in, in a situation where publishers and songwriters um, are benefiting. And one of the best ways of doing that, rather than necessarily kind of fighting about the size of the pie or, or the pie you've got now, it's trying to work out what's the pie going to look like in five years' time and how can we make sure that as an industry um, and as a country, we're taking the opportunities of that and making sure that we are seizing the, um, the benefits of that. Because what you don't want is in five years to think, ah, there's a really easy, really simple thing we could have done in 2021, but we didn't do it, and now we're at a loss of it. So trying to take a really future-focused um, and a predictive attitude and approach to these things is incredibly important. But also looking to try and seize the opportunity. When it comes to things like tech and live streaming, I still hear from orchestras, in particular, actually in particular orchestras, who had never really, uh, had never really felt like film concerts before. Um, they've never really done this sort of thing before. They've tried it, they think it's amazing, and even post-pandemic, they're going to keep it. Um, so making sure we're seizing those opportunities, but also seizing opportunities as a country, because the challenge for us internationally is when it comes to things like live streaming, every country is looking at this, every country is trying to do this, and the thing we don't want to be done is left behind. So lots of people, lots of people say to me, oh, audiences aren't interested in live streaming. They want to go to, they want to go to something live. Um, actually, I don't quite agree. I think people, audiences don't like bad live streaming. If you can create something like this in a way that is kind of audience friendly, is engaging, um, and can really grip audiences, it could be absolutely huge. Uh, and the question really needs to be is how do we see these emerging technologies, harness them and make sure they're working for our industry rather than just kind of burying our head in the sands and in five or ten years time wishing we'd be a little bit, a bit more front footed about it. Thank you, Matt. I mean, it's been a, it's been a really real huge canter through your your sort of working career, and hopefully you've you've given people an insight into that horrible waking up at half past five in the morning and not getting any sleep kind of career and the the excitement of being right at the the very front of this this incredible story and incredible in a, in a bad way, I suppose. And hopefully you've also given some hope to um, to musicians and technicians as well who have been uh, you know, having a really difficult year. That there's there's hope to go, and also to those say music students who'll be watching this. Just quickly, how can they get in touch with UK music? and, and what, what, what's the best way for them to reach out and learn more? Yeah, so um, they can go to our, our website, um, ukmusic.org, um, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and yeah, do, do get in touch. We, as a body, we represent the whole music industry. There's lots of individual groups and organisations that represent artists, that represent record labels, that represent rights holders. As a body, we represent the industry as a whole. Um, and so we want to be doing every account of things like Talent Pipeline in particular, um, supporting artists, um, supporting the creators and supporting the, the thousands of businesses across the music industry that, um, that are trying to succeed. So we're keen to be as helpful as we can and you can find us on, the, on our website, Facebook or Twitter. Last question, uh, living or dead, money no object, uh, 21st of June or whenever it is rolls around, what's the first live gig you and I are going to watch? So we are going to be crowded around a piano somewhere, probably at some of it will be crowded around a piano somewhere me and you are going to go to players, we're going to sing at the piano and we're going to put on, we're, we're not going to watch a concert, then. we're going to be putting on the concert and we're going to be, we're going to be having a great time, I promise you. Brilliant. Well, I've had a great time and I'm sure everybody who's watched this and will be watching it on YouTube later has as well. So CEO of UK Music, Jamie and Joko Goodwin, thank you very much and good luck in saving the, the British music industry. Thank you, mate.